we're still on our series for the woman of God, and I think this is our third or fourth video on it. And this time we're going to talk about pampering the self. And we're going to use Philippians 2 as our um, launching point. So let me go ahead and read from the rooted word. This is the precise English translation because the common English is not finished yet. And this is from verses 3 through verses 8. So bear with me because since it's a precise translation, it's more like the Greek than it is like English with English words. So the syntax, the word order is more like Greek. It's a little difficult, but I'll go ahead and read it through once as I usually do. And then I'll pause and read through each part and explain. And we'll talk about how, what that has to do with the woman of God. Philippians 2, verse 3. No one according to provoking intrigue, even desolate glory seeking, but into depressed emotional thoughts, leading, holding one another above oneself. Each of you must not take aim at things of yourselves, but also each at things of others. For this must exercise the mind in you that also is in Christ Jesus who in the form of God, being under beginning and authority, does not himself lead a rapture to be like God. But he empties himself and takes upon him the form of a servant and is made in the likeness of a human being, who in schematic likeness is found as a man. He depresses himself. He becomes himself an attentive listener as far as death, but death from a cross. So it reads quite differently than the King James, because as we find in certain key passages, the King James mutilates what was there in the original language. And all we're doing is we're taking and translating it literally and digging into the roots of each word and drawing that meaning to the surface as well. And you can see that it actually breaks open. The passage is like a flower blossoming. You can really see inside of it. Difficult to make sense of it from the precise English translation, but go ahead and bear with me. We'll go one part at a time. So it says, no one according to provoking intrigue, even desolate glory seeking, but into depressed emotional thoughts, leading, holding one another above oneself. That's very difficult because it doesn't have your standard structure that an English sentence has there are a lot of things that are implied in it. So, you must not be provoking intrigue. That's what it's saying. You should not be doing things in such a way, that's the according to, in such a way that you're provoking intrigue. And you must definitely, even more than that, not be seeking for glory, which is a desolate thing. The desolate, remember we talked about desolation, where you've got a plot of land that nothing can grow on. No matter what you do to it, you can't get anything to grow on it. That's desolate. So it says the glory seeking is desolate. Seeking after glory is desolate. So uh, if you remember, there was um, a guy, Marcus Rogers, that I did a false teacher video on. Actually, he's not listed among our false teachers, although he is a false teacher. He is under deceptions of the heart. And I ran across him again just yesterday uh, through a little bit of leapfrogging. Uh, one guy who left a, a comment on one of my videos here, I went and checked his channel out, and then I saw a channel mentioned there, and I went and saw her video, and she mentions Marcus Rogers and uh, how he turned her life around and that he's a preacher of truth. Well, I knew the name because I'd done this video on him and the deceptions of his heart and how he's, uh, he's so prideful. And it's all focused on, on trying to be the sexiest and the most handsome and the most you know, amazing looking person on the outside. And he says so. He says there's nothing wrong with that. So he's, he's not preaching the gospel of Christ. He's preaching this fleshly lust as part of the Christian walk, which has never historically been part of the Christian walk. It's been the thing that we, we 
push out, we teach people to to run away from that. So this is this is about this kind of attitude that he has. If you want, I'll try to remember to put the video up. I think it's going to go over here, and that will. You can go watch the video again. It's about deceptions of the heart, Marcus Rogers, and you'll see my video up there. You can go ahead and click on the link. It says glory seeking. Glory seeking. Our role in the body of Christ, in the church, is not to seek glory. In the world, is not to seek glory. Remember that Jesus' temptation in the desert uh, by the devil, he was trying to offer him opportunities of glory. And Christ resisted it. Christ rejected it. And we are to follow in his steps. Because glory seeking is desolate. It is desolate. Nothing can grow there. Spiritually, nothing can grow there. It becomes a wasteland. Everything that you put there dies. And so it says, but into depressed emotional thoughts. Depressed means to lower yourself lower than other people. Like you have an indentation in the ground that you're getting down into so that you are physically lowered even than their feet. This is the picture of the Greek word. So, but into depressed emotional thoughts, your emotional thoughts, it's not just thoughts, it's emotional thoughts, it's from down here. That they, you bring that down so that you are lower even than the lowest part of someone else. Leading, holding one another above oneself. That leading part is important. That doing that with your emotional thoughts leads you in, sorry about that, leads you into your actions, right? It leads you through your actions to where you're holding others above yourself. This is a whole big picture that's being laid out for us in the Greek. Verse 4. Now remember, this is in context of, of Christ's attitude, what he did, going to the cross to die for us. Verse 4. Each of you must not take aim at things of yourselves, but also each at things of others. You say, also. First it says this, that we're not to, then it says also, implying that we can. Okay? Well, it says, it says literally, you, each of you must not take aim at things of yourselves, but also each at things of others. Okay? So, the, th the things that you aim for for yourself cannot be so strict of a goal that you plow over the needs and the goals of someone else in the body. This is talking about in the body of Christ, especially there. Your goals cannot be so exalted, so high, so glorified that you're going to you're going to knock over someone in their goals. Okay? So number five, verse five. For this, for this, what I just said is this. Okay? For this must exercise the mind in you that also is in Christ Jesus. For this, this must exercise it must exercise the mind in you. It must make it stronger, more, vir more virulent, um, with more strength. That you are stronger as Christ Jesus in how you're using your mind. This is each of you must not take aim at things of yourselves, but also each at things of others. For this, doing this, must exercise the mind in you that also is in Christ Jesus. And by doing that, you're becoming more like Jesus. Then it describes who Jesus was, who in the form of God, being under beginning and authority, and you go, what? If you remember, in Arache and Hologos, Kaiologos in Prostonteum, 
kaitheos and hologos. I've said this to you before from John 1.1. 1, 1. That's the Greek. And that's one of the most important passages in the whole Bible. And John is going back to Genesis when he's talking about it. But this word arche, I've mentioned this before, I'll mention it again. The word arche, in arche and hologos, in the beginning was the word in English. It's usually translated, but it's not full enough. Because arche means two things at once. And I verified this with native Greek speakers. It means both beginning of beginnings and authority of authorities. Arche means beginning and authority both at once. And we can see that in the English with monarchy, anarchy. Those are about authority, not beginning. Monarchy is one authority. Anarchy is without authority. But then you've got archaeology, which is the study of beginnings. So even in English, we have both of them, but we've separated them out. But in Greek, when you have that word, it means both at the same time. So it says, who in the form of God, being under beginning and authority, how can Christ be under the beginning and authority? It says, in Arche and Hologos, in the beginning was the word, in the beginning and authority was the word. Well, the word wasn't the beginning and the authority. It says that he was in the beginning and in the authority. So in here it says, who in the form of God, being under beginning and under authority, does not himself lead a rapture to be like God. And it is that word harpazo that we talk about all the time when these people of the apostate church, they talk about rapture, 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 rapture. And rapture is not a biblical concept. The second coming of Christ is. But they talk about two more comings of Christ, which is heretical. Christ is not coming twice again. He's coming once again. And the Bible describes that in detail. Rapture is just a, a, a description of something that happens at that time. But they've taken that as a term and then created this whole other event. That's not true. But here it uses it to say that Jesus does not himself lead a rapture to be like God. So this contradicts their whole premise. Verse 7. And notice, rapture is like to seize, to grab hold of and seize, like pull up and out. It's used when Jesus is talking about the wolves who snatch the sheep out. That's rapture. The wolves rapture the sheep. They take a sheep out from the flock to drag him off and eat him. Jesus does not himself lead a rapture to be like God. And we know that because of the temptation in the desert. When Satan offered him, to be like God over the kingdoms of the earth. And he rejected it. Verse 7, but he empties himself. He empties himself and takes upon him the form of a servant. When was the last time you did that? Especially with those who are nearest to you and dearest to you. When was the last time that you emptied yourself of the things that you thought were the most important things to do and you became a servant and you did the things that someone else wanted you to do or the things that someone else needed you to do without complaining without questioning just doing it, it says but he empties himself Jesus and takes upon him the form of a servant and is made in the likeness of a human being now, I've talked about this before too that vast difference between God and man, there is nothing, nothing so great of a distance from us to something else. If we took an amoeba, you know, or even an inanimate thing like a molecule or an atom or subatomic particles, that difference between us and that is not even a drop compared to the difference between God and man. And so for Christ to take on the likeness of a human being is astounding. There's no way that we could do that ourselves, make that big of a, of, a, of a change in humility. The most humble we could become is not even a speck compared to what Jesus did when he became man. Number eight, verse eight, who in schematic likeness is found as a man. He depresses himself, there's that, that idea again, 
of a level ground and a depression made down inside that you get down inside to be lower than everyone else. He depresses himself, because remember, he didn't hurl an insult at those who were insulting him. He took it. He took it. And he went to the cross. And he died. Who in schematic likeness is found as a man, he depresses himself, he becomes himself an attentive listener. As far as death. That's what it says. He becomes himself an attentive listener as far as death. That's literally what it says in the Greek. And we don't find that in English anywhere or in the Russian Synod. It's not there either. For those of you who are listening from, from Ukraine and from, well, I don't have many in Russia, but mostly Ukraine. Who in schematic likeness is found as a man, he depresses himself, he becomes himself an attentive listener as far as death. Are you an attentive listener, even to the point of death? It says, but death from a cross. So now, let's talk about being a woman of God, and what does this have to do with you? I want to talk about pampering in particular, because I see too many women taking on the attitude of the Western women, especially, where there's this this attitude of pampering. They want to pamper themselves. But you have to understand that when you do that, you don't leave room for the man. What's the man going to do for you? How can he pamper you? You're already pampering yourself. You don't need a man. You've excluded him as an option from your world. What's he going to do? You've got everything you want. You've got everything you need. And you're pampering yourself and pampering yourself and spoiling yourself. And you know, a man can see that in a woman immediately. And when it says about emptying yourself, emptying yourself, being ready, being ready to be pampered, to be spoiled by the man, right? But if you're doing it yourself, then you don't leave room for the man in your world. The woman of God doesn't do that. The woman of God leaves that room for someone else to do that for her. Okay, so, and that goes back to the beginning of this passage as well, where it says, No one according to provoking intrigue, even desolate glory seeking, but into depressed emotional thoughts, leading, holding one another above himself. Each of you must not take aim at things of yourselves. If you want to be a woman of God, and you want to keep that room for the man to come into your world and to take care of the things that are for you, look after the things of others, primarily. Look after those. Take care of yourself, of course. Take care of yourself. But I'm talking about going beyond that and pampering and spoiling. Do that for others, not for yourself. Leave that, that they can see so that the man can come into your world and do that for you and if you don't do that then you're going to be signaling to the men that you don't need them and they don't really have a place in your world so it's something to, to chew on and to think about something to meditate about may the Lord bless you as you seek him with all your heart remember to subscribe down below and like the video and share it on your Facebook and other social media. And then make a comment, whether a question or a comment. We read all of them, and we try to respond to all. Get on over to our website, The Rooted Word, and start reading the translation and also the articles we've posted. It's at therootedword.com, therootedword.com. And may the Lord bless you as you seek Him with all your heart.